Welcome to the third of our politicians and professionals seminars. We're at the midpoint, having had the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party, and tonight, Patrick Harvey, leader of the Green Party in Scotland. Um, we're delighted in the David Hume Institute to have the support of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland, and the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. Uh, one change to the program tonight, uh, the chair was to have been Athol Duncan of ICAS, but he's been called away, uh, and so we're delighted that uh, Hector McQueen, the chair of the David Hume Institute, is going to chair the discussion later on. The form is as it always has been. We'll, we'll ask Patrick to speak for perhaps 45 minutes, and then we'll have an equal time for discussion after that, uh, and then... Um, I will come and invite you to have a drink with us later on. But without any more ado, I'll hand over to Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation once again to come and speak. And um, I suppose I, I always find it a little bit amusing that the, the series is called The Politicians and the Professionals, just to completely distinguish those different categories. <laughs> Um, the, the rank amateurs and the professionals, that would, that would do for me as well. Uh, I think one of your um, colleagues phoned up our office and asked for, uh, said he was going to be tweeting, so somebody out there, somebody's going to be tweeting me, and, and asked if um, we could let, let them know what I was going to say. And basically, I was still scrabbling away with a few notes. I'm not the kind of person who's ever likely to write a 45-minute speech and come here and read it out word for word. So it, forgive me if this is a wee bit more um, uh, improv than you're used to, but that's just what I'm like. Um, I was asked to give a theme, uh, a, a wee bit of a, a, an introductory paragraph, a theme, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I said I'd like to talk about whatever happened to the politics of hope, because part of what I feel frustrated by, continually frustrated by, uh, these days is the sense that a crisis which could have been turned into an opportunity by progressive forces in this country and around the world was missed. And it was instead turned into an opportunity by those who brought the crisis about, by those who benefited from the system which led to the crisis uh, and not uh, benefited not by those who benefited, uh, not by those who, who bore the, the, the social and environmental burden of, of that system. And in many ways, this, this sense of a missed opportunity has been a recurring theme on a whole host of different issues over the years since the financial crisis and the economic crisis that followed uh, and the social crisis which is resulting from austerity, austerity which has been imposed on the pretext of that economic crisis. It's, it's a theme that I can relate to so many aspects of our lives. Just today, we've seen a report from Citizens Advice Scotland about conditions in the workplace, about a, a rise in the experience of people being subjected to discrimination, abuse, a failure to live up to basic standards that we thought had been legally accepted by everyone, even in terms of the minimum wage, even in terms of uh, gender discrimination, uh, women being sacked because they're pregnant. You know, a lot of people had thought that kind of thing uh, was the thing of the past, but it's not so. People being subjected to racist harassment uh, in the workplace. Many people who are lucky enough to live and work uh, in certain circles might think that that's a thing of the past, but it isn't so. People being denied sick pay and holiday pay. And worse still, worse than just a recognition that these long-standing social ills in the workplace are still with us, a change to a situation where people have to actually pay for the privilege of taking those cases to a tribunal and seeking some redress, seeking some justice from society for the abuses that they've been subjected to in the workplace. Now, 
that's so much deeper a problem than it was when I was growing up. When I was growing up, you know, we were already being told the world of work is changing. The idea of a, of a secure job uh, is a thing of the past. When I was growing up, we were already being told that uh, training schemes uh, would, uh, would be a requirement and we shouldn't expect to be paid for the work that we were doing uh, or that many of us were doing in those, those schemes. And employers would gain the benefit of somebody's work, would gain the benefit of somebody's work, of somebody's time, without having to pay them. Not long after that, we started to see the welfare state being turned into a machine for subsidising low pay. Subsidising low pay. So the employers don't need to pay you what you need to live with a bit of dignity. The welfare state will, will make up for that. So work no longer represented a route out of poverty for so many people. And a great deal of the poverty that we have in our society now is working poverty. But even at that point, as I was growing up and these things were beginning, you know, I couldn't have imagined that people would be subjected to zero hours contracts, that people would be required to be available pretty much full time, to put the rest of their life on hold according to pretty much full time hours, but never know from week to week what their working hours are going to be or what their income is going to be. So for a far lower remuneration, a far lower sense of respect and dignity, you still have to sacrifice the same amount in terms of your friends, your family, your relationships, your study, your play, the things that actually matter in life beyond just earning a crust. So this economic crisis has been used by those who were already moving the workplace environment for, for very many people in, a, a, in my view, a socially harmful and divisive direction, this economic crisis be, has been used to further drive things in that same direction. In private and public sector employ, employment, we've seen the economic crisis used to drive real terms pay cuts year after year after year at the time of rising prices, a rising price in the, in the cost of living. We've seen uh, more and more people subjected to those zero hours contracts and minimum wages, people who literally have no other option, people who, whose housing costs are going up as well, whose energy costs are going up as well, whose food costs are going up as well. This is deepening uh, a chasm of inequality. And many of the multinationals that are worst offenders in these areas happily sign up to the same kind of rhetoric as certain government ministers that we're all in it together and there's no money left and we all have to tighten our belts while the owners of these businesses are stashing their wealth in tax havens, not contributing to the common wheel, not contributing to the common good. And this gulf of inequality grows even wider. That has been deliberately driven by those who saw the economic crisis as an opportunity to entrench the system that had brought it about. Now, is there, is there an alternative? Well, I, I think that part of the reason why that change in the workplace has been made possible is not just a right-wing press that cultivates the myth that people in poverty are to blame for their poverty and cultivates stigma uh, and harassment against them. Not just a supine left which was implicated in the system that brought it about, which had reached an accommodation with neoliberalism rather than recognizing that its job was to challenge that system. But also, way back before that point, the beginnings of a long-term decline in the representation of people within their workplace. Democratic workplaces don't behave this way. Workplaces where decisions are made on a shared basis, don't behave this way. Workplaces where pay scales are equal show a degree of respect that is equal. Workplaces need to become democratic again. And I think the long-term decline in trade unions, both in terms of membership and their ability to act on behalf of their members, is a large part of what made it possible for successive governments to see the employment picture move in this direction for so many people. We need to recapture a spirit of democratic workplaces. And I think if, if the politics of hope means something in the workplace, if it means something in employment, then it does mean looking, for example, at the range of uh, 
employment, uh, of uh, business support services that the Scottish Government, the UK Government and local government make available and say, let us gear these toward more democratic workplaces. That doesn't just mean one model. It doesn't just mean you have to have X amount of union representation. It could mean workers' cooperatives. The, the role of cooperative ownership models could be far greater in a range of different sectors than it is now. It could mean uh, a system of shared decision-making between employers and employees. There's a range of different ways of doing it, and different employees will have different priorities about how they think it ought to work. But the principle should be moving us in the direction of more democratic workplaces. And if we have more democratic workplaces, I think we've got the chance to transform the economic relationships, the economic meaning of work in people's lives. Work is important in people's lives. Work isn't just about having enough money to pay the bills. And most people, when they're asked about what they need in life to, to have a, a decent life in their community, they don't talk about you know, football player salaries. They don't talk about aspiring to mega bucks. They talk about having enough money to pay the bills, enough money to have a holiday, enough money to live with dignity. People, most people get the idea of enough in a way that many economists and many CEOs, it seems, don't understand the concept of enough in life. But if we, if we move in the direction of this democratic workplace, this movement toward more democratic workplaces, I think we'll be able to have a, a situation where work does provide enough, enough in the way of money, enough in the way of dignity and respect for people. That would be a hopeful employment policy, I believe, for Scotland. It's inconvenient that some of the decision-making power is split between the two governments. It's inconvenient as well that the steps we're making in the direction of more powers for Scotland don't go as far as I might like. Some might take the opposite view. It's interesting, though, that the Labour movement was far more interested in the issue of workplace devolution than the Labour Party was. That interesting difference, I think, is one that is yet to be explored and fully understood as to why that's happened, why that, that divergence has happened. Uh, and I think if, uh, if Jim Murphy can do anything useful at the moment, it might be to understand where the connection with the movement that gave birth to his party needs to be restored. On a whole host of other issues, the same sense of propping up a broken system, the same sense that our response to the crisis has allowed people to make the, the, the system that caused it stronger still, uh, I want to touch on one or two others. Energy is something which maybe... 10 or 20 years ago, was, was not so high up the political agenda. But as the energy mix has changed, as the expectations of an ever-rising consumption of energy uh, have become ever harder to meet, and as the geopolitics of energy have changed and the environmental politics of energy have come more onto people's horizon, become more urgent, energy is a, is a much higher political issue over the last few years. And yet, what have we seen in response to a crisis in the oil price? A desperate attempt to get back to business as usual. A desperate attempt to prop up a system which we know is mortal. A system which we know is finite, which is ending. And I say that in relation to an, a number of fossil fuels. Right now, uh, there's a, a, a crisis still uh, an environmental and an economic crisis still going in the open-cast coal industry in Scotland, for example. The early days of the SNP government saw an expansion of open-cast. Open-cast hasn't been economically viable in its own right for years. It's creating an environmental legacy of destruction and damage, and then it walks away. A company folds, another company sets up, takes over the assets, abandons the liabilities, and it's the taxpayer uh, or... More often, sadly, not even the taxpayer, but the person left living next to the environmental damage that's never restored that has to pick up the tab. The tab is paid in environmental and economic terms by the public or the taxpayer, not by the industry that has already extracted profit from the ground. And yet, in, in response to the, the most recent open cast uh, crisis, 
what came about was an attempt by both Scottish and UK governments to prop the system up again. Let's, let's find a way of subsidising their access to the railways so they don't pay what other businesses pay to access the railways. That's, that's going to help make their industry more viable. Let's give them a tax break on taxes they pay for the environmental destruction they cause. Let's give them a tax break in order to allow them to restore some of the land uh, which uh, they're continuing to make worse by continuing to expand further open cast extraction. So in response to this crisis of an unsustainable industry, governments seem desperate to get back to business as usual and prop it up again. One more roll of the dice. One more roll of the dice. We're seeing this with the oil industry as well now. The oil industry has done very well for some people in Scotland. Not for everyone in Scotland. Like most countries with oil, we don't share the wealth very well. The wealth is not shared that's come from that industry. But yeah, some people have done very well. Some whole regions have done very well. And in the Northeast, you could be a, a passionate environmentalist and still be deeply worried about the economic impact on your community that's going to happen from what's happening to the oil industry at the moment. But do we really think that a coherent, long-term, sustainable response to that, one that's going to give your kids an economic future, not just your own community, today and tomorrow, do we really think that comes from giving tax breaks to the industry for further exploration for yet more fossil fuels that we can't afford to burn? The problem here is the economic vulnerability of overexposure to a bubble, a classic bubble, an asset which is overvalued, an industry which is overvalued. The oil and gas sector is valued on the basis that it can turn all of its reserves into profit. It's not true. Or at least if they try, they'll crash the entire economy and the ecosystem with it. The world has four or five times more fossil fuels than we can afford to burn. And even diverting some of that into non-fuel petrochemical uses, which we're again over-reliant on, isn't the solution in its own right because not all of that resource is right for those uses and a great many of the products, uh, the goods and products that those, those hydrocarbons end up in, uh, that they'll end their lives in incinerators anyway. So the fossil carbon still ends up in the atmosphere, just a slightly longer cycle. The idea that a, a, a long-term, sustainable economic future can be balanced precariously on this bubble, I think that's madness. I think that's leaving our economy ever more at risk. Because at some point, we'll have to reach a recognition that the next oil shock is going to be the last oil shock. Do we want our economy still to be so dependent, so dependent on a short term, uh, here today, gone tomorrow commodity, or a here today, unusable tomorrow commodity? Do we want our economy to be so dependent on that that when that bubble bursts, it takes us down with it? And when, when that bubble bursts at a global level, not just in terms of the viability of one particular oil field, when that bubble bursts at a global level and a recognition that this industry is vastly overvalued, the economic damage from that could make the, the last seven or eight years look like a broken piggy bank. On fracking as well, that third element of this fossil fuel story that I want to talk about, what we're seeing is yet another attempt to add to the stocks of fossil fuels that we can't afford to burn. The idea, the idea that we can follow uh, a course of practice that in America has uh, led to appalling abuses of environmental regulation, environmental regulations which are probably stronger in Europe, but which if the EU and the US get their way in handing over environmental and social regulations to corporate interests through a trade deal known as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, we could be leveling down those environmental and social protections to the lowest common denominator rather than leveling them up to the highest common denominator as we should do. So we could end up letting this industry get a foot in the door on the basis that we've got better regulatory standards in Europe. We're, we're better at this. We know what we're doing. Only to see those regulatory standards pulled out from under us and see the worst of that environmental <coughs> malpractice perpetrated uh, in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And for what? 
For what? For a substance or a group of substances which, again, even its advocates recognise is not going to markedly change the oil price or the energy price for consumers in this country. Substances which, again, are adding to these stocks of fossil fuels of which we already have more than we can afford to burn and potentially distracting the need for investment from the kind of energy policies that genuinely are sustainable, genuinely will meet people's social, economic and environmental needs through demand reduction and through shared ownership uh, of uh, as renewable as possible an energy generating mix. And shared ownership, shared ownership in my view is the response that the politics of hope needs to offer in relation to energy. The resentment the justified resentment that so many of us feel when we open the pictures and we see yet again energy prices are shooting up or later on energy prices are dropping slowly like a feather. The justifiable anger that people feel is partly driven by the fact that this industry is not benefiting the common weal, is not inspired by a vision of a shared and collective approach to society. Now, there are some publicly owned uh, energy companies developing renewables, including wind on and offshore in this country. Just not our publicly, sector, publicly owned uh, energy companies. Other European countries never got rid of their public energy companies. And they've got some fossil fuel in the mix. They've got some nuclear in the mix. But they're moving substantively in a renewable energy direction. And if we could do that, if we could do that in Scotland, we'd ensure that at least a portion of this industry is generating not only clean energy, but revenue for the public good. Now, I'm not sure whether a Scottish government in the current devolution settlement or even the one that may be coming around the corner is able to do this, but local authorities already could. Local authorities already have the opportunity to create local energy companies. And it might be that there's a range of models out there, some of them in partnership with the private sector, some of them in partnership with the community sector, some of them standalone, fully publicly owned by a local authority. Using local authority borrowing power, borrowing powers that John Swinney doesn't yet have, but which local authorities uh, can do, to invest in something which will generate profit in the future that can service that debt. If local authorities were given that sense of empowerment, that sense of purpose in relation to energy, that many other European countries, their local government level, never lost that, that sense of connection with energy, then we could be seeing every local, every publicly owned building, every publicly owned piece of land, every publicly owned asset assessed for its potential to generate renewable energy, whether that's through solar, whether that's through wind, whether that's through combined heat and power, whether it's through the whole host of renewable technologies that are out there. And by doing that, they could demonstrate to house builders, the house builders that we're depending on to do better than they've done so far, to build genuinely sustainable, low carbon, even zero energy homes, homes that harness all of their energy from the ambient environment. And this is not beyond the wit of man. Even in a cold country like Scotland, this is technically achievable if we've only got the will to do it. It's even affordable if we do it at scale. But a locally owned energy company could be providing to house builders in the private sector or the housing associations the extra investment up front that they need to put the kit in to make those homes really sustainable, really low carbon, really low cost to keep warm and to keep lit. And from the money saved, if the en local energy company was also the energy service provider, at least for a fixed period, then the money saved would be repaying that debt, demonstrating that this is a, a, a transformation in our built environment that could be genuinely self-sustaining, self-financing, uh, as well as uh, environmentally sustainable. That's the kind of hopeful vision that could lead us to a position where in 10 years, in 15 years, we might have a network of local energy companies around Scotland, which if we're ready and when we're able, we could join together into a national energy company to start meeting our needs on an industrial scale as well. Because industrial scale energy generation is going to continue to be necessary, even if we do dramatically reduce our energy waste uh, and, and bring our consumption to within reasonable limits. 
But industrial scale generation doesn't have to mean that it's only going to serve the interests uh, of giant companies that we can end up resenting when we see their logo on the bill that we pay uh, every couple of months. So these are just a couple of examples of where I think the, the system which has brought us to this point, the system which, uh, the economic and political system, which has brought us to a point of economic crisis, environmental crisis, social crisis, the forces that built that system and which benefited from it have used those crises to strengthen themselves, to redouble their efforts, to get back to business as usual. How often have we heard that phrase in, in political debate of recent years? We've got to get back to business as usual. Our doors must be open. The opportunity has to be to say what we've done so far over the last few decades hasn't been right, it hasn't been good enough, and we deserve better. What has to be taken is an opportunity, a crisis as an opportunity for progressive forces to say when a system is failing, there's no better time to ask yourself, what kind of system do you really want? Whose interests was that system serving? When growth stalls, what better time to ask, what are we trying to grow here, and why, and for whom? What does growth even mean? You know, that's a, a question which economists have been conscientiously and studiously avoiding answering for decades, for generations. But it never went away. And in the face of limits to growth, environmental and social limits to growth, it's a question that needs to be answered. And when money is tight, what better time, no more urgent time to ask ourselves what our real priorities are for how we spend our money and for how we generate our money, in whose interests uh, are we running an economic system. I think, finally, Europe has got an example of the politics of hope in action. And the election result in Greece, which has troubled many, and it should, it should trouble many, it should trouble those who want to get back to business as usual. They, those are people who deserve to be troubled, who need to be troubled at the moment. The election result in Greece, which demonstrates the resolve of a country to say, not just we're sick and tired of it, not just we're fed up of being failed by our political class, not just we don't think that our economy is working in our interests, but actually something much more profound than that. Because you can hear that kind of politics of resentment in this country already. You can hear it from the purple menace in, in the UK when they say, blame this, hate that, get rid of those people. The, the hard right only has that politics of resentment. It's tapping into a justifiable anger, but it fails to offer hope. It fails to offer the politics of hope. What the Syriza movement in Greece and its election have shown is not just a rejection of a system that failed, but a belief that this country, I think, has lost for a very long time, a belief that politics is capable of changing our society for the better, a belief that politics is capable of doing things right, not just that politics and politicians uh, are, well, pick your adjective. None of them are very nice in this country, are they? Let's face it. Politics is held in pretty low regard, close to contempt in this country, and in many ways, politics has earned that status. We need to recapture the idea that politics is capable of changing society for the better. It used to be believed in this country. And the generation after the Second World War, you know, it's so many of those referendum debates in schools uh, that we had in, in the last few months, I, I ended up making this, this pitch to young people because I was trying to impress upon them how rare an opportunity they had to ask and answer a defining question. What kind of society do you want to live in? Not just, you know, Scotland or UK, not just one flag or the other, but what kind of society do you want to live in? That opportunity comes around so very, very rarely. The generation after the Second World War, beaten up economically, physically, emotionally traumatized, could quite easily have said it's too difficult, it's too hard. Where can we find hope from after that? They didn't. 
they built something together to be proud of. They built something, a legacy, which to our shame, our generation is allowing to be torn to pieces. I don't think we're going to recapture not just that legacy. I don't think we're going to rebuild that, that legacy unless we can recapture the idea that politics is capable of doing something better. Our society deserves to be better, and by working together collectively, we're capable of achieving that. Now, I don't know whether, whether that, that mood, that spirit, can be achieved in this country. I think, in many ways, some of us saw the referendum as an attempt to do that. And a great many people felt that, and a great many other people didn't. It didn't bring the country fulsomely together. If, if there had been a yes vote, I would have wanted it to be a 70, 80, 90% yes vote. I would have wanted it to be the kind of movement that we see in Catalonia or other parts of Europe where a movement for self-determination is a genuinely mass movement, something that brings a country together. That spirit of optimism and hope and change did manage to inspire some people, but frightened others in the referendum. And I don't think we're going to see it from an election. Elections don't achieve that in this country. We're going to have to find other ways to connect with people to ensure that politics is no longer seen as something that's done to you, but something that we all participate in together. I think all of us should be looking to what happens in Greece over the next few months, not only hoping that a deal gets done, but hoping that that spirit of optimism, of the ability of a country to take control of itself, to bring power back under democratic control, that's the principle that needs to stay alive whatever happens to the future of Greece in economic terms or its relationship with Europe and the Euro. That spirit needs to spread and infiltrate all of the, the rest of our democracies, our, our broken democracies, where power and people have become so disconnected. So that's the pitch, and I suppose I ought to end with the answer of how we achieve it, and I'm afraid I don't know. But maybe we'll explore that in the Q&A. And sum up in a few words, but uh, your, your, your strap line was the politics of hope, I think you said. Um, and um, uh, within that, you were perhaps addressing the issues of inequality, which have been talked about a good deal in this institute over its uh, winter series. Um, the environmental issues that we all associate uh, uh, with, with your party and the comparisons towards the end uh, with other European countries, regions, whatever you want to call Greece and Catalonia uh, in, in, in this present context. So I think there's quite a range of issues, uh, current and uh, long term, which uh, have been raised by what you say and I'm sure that people will uh, want to uh, make comments and questions. Um, can I ask you to show in the customary manner, that is by raising your hand, um, uh, I, I would like to perhaps take two or three questions together, as it were, to, to allow Patrick uh, the chance to develop themes and threads that may come through them. Um, when you do rise to your, uh, and perhaps I should say you should rise to your feet to give uh, your question, I think it's better the, the people can see who you are you, but you should also identify uh, yourself, and there are microphones uh, roving on either side of the room, uh, so uh, you should be able to make yourself heard as well. So can I perhaps call for the uh, first group of hands to show uh, and break the... There's one down here. Are there any others just at this particular point, or shall we see if this icebreaker takes us through? Yes, we've got a second question just here. But please, sir. Patrick Gordon Cairns, um, thanks for what I thought was a brilliant, uh, thought-provoking, passionate speech. I have to say that first of all. Um, I agree with you with regard to the widening gulf uh, between the rich and the poor in this country. I've had the privilege of having a senior management career 
and I've seen the greed that exists at senior management level. And I don't think that's good economically, and I don't think it's good for society as well. And I'd like to ask you how you would sort that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought his speech... Uh, In three perhaps. steps. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, James Joyner. Um, actually, my question is, is related. Um, so again, I surprised myself by agreeing with a lot of what you were saying. So I agree, zero, con zero hour contracts are bad, um, and executive pay being high is bad. I kind of didn't really agree with the potential solution around having demographic work workplaces as being the solution. I kind of think that's maybe part of it, but what are the other kind of reasons for what things we could actually do to change things? I've just spotted a third hand at the back, so to, to keep my formula of three questions for you to answer, Patrick, let's take this William one as well. Redmond, uh, I'm on the Ten News Board. Uh, my question is, uh, as I listened to you, is uh, can we afford the rich <laughs> in this country? <laughs> because, uh, sorry, because uh, according to yourself uh, and some of the other punters, is, uh, do they pay in to, towards their country? Okay, but it's all, all yours. I mean, I, I certainly think we can't afford the degree of inequality that we have. I think it's, um, I think it's destructive in terms of the social solidarity that people feel with one another. If you want to live in a society uh, instead of living in a hotel, you know, some people have this hotel notion of, uh, of, of what a country is. You, you pay your bills and in exchange you get your services. Uh, you know, that's, that's how a hotel works. It's not how a society works. A society is supposed to work on the basis that we actually give a damn about one another and that we look after one another and that we are human beings who share space with one another. Um, and and the, 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 the gulf of inequality undermines that. I certainly think we can't afford it ecologically because people who are literally living on the breadline or below the breadline, I'm not going to ask them to, to try and have the time to focus on what often feel like abstract questions about, about how they live and the nature of consumerism and energy consumption and, 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 and work patterns and living patterns and transport patterns and stuff. They're just trying to get by. And I'm going to have no hope in hell of trying to persuade... Uh, the super rich, that they don't need another foreign holiday, they don't need another this, another that. The, the, the degree of overconsumption of finite resources at the super rich end is, is absurd. A fairer spread uh, of consumption of the resources we can afford to consume uh, is, I think, the, the best way of achieving uh, a degree of sustainability and, and bringing us back within those ecological limits. So I don't think it's affordable socially, economically, or environmentally. This, this gulf is, is bad on all three counts. What can we do about it? I mean, this is, this is a, a problem which, as I tried to say, most of the, the political spectrum, I think, is, is implicating this. We see this just over the last few days with uh, Miliband being given a drubbing in the press because he's not schmoozing big business enough because he's not being friendly enough with big business. Um, now, either a, a political party that wants to gain a majority at UK level either has to schmooze big business, cozy up to big business, and tell big business that it'll get what it wants, or it is going to have to accept that it's going to be pilloried in, in the press. It becomes very, very difficult even with the best will in the world, for either political party to do anything coherent about this in this two-party dichotomy that, that is the UK political landscape. And it's changing. It is changing. It's becoming a spread beyond those two big parties, but they are still the biggest power blocks, and whatever the election result, the next government will be dominated by one of those two parties. Now, if you can't expect... Real, you, can, you can have a, a legitimate expectation, but a realistic one, I'm not so sure, of either of those two parties taking coherent action against this grotesque inequality. I think you need to look to other forms of democratic power. And that's, that's why I talked about democratic workplaces. I think trade unions are an important part of that, but not the only part of it. Cooperative models of ownership 
uh, worker participation on boards. Uh, there's a whole host of ways of doing it. Work, more democratic workplaces have lower pay ratios. More democratic workplaces do respect workers' rights. They do take issues of discrimination and harassment and bullying seriously. The evidence is, is uh, pretty much overwhelming, not just from this country, but from around the world. More democratic workplaces end up being the more just employers. Uh, and that is, that is one of the things that I think we can do to put power back away from those who've hoarded it uh, and back towards those for whom it's supposed to operate, which is all of us. Um, you know, if, if I genuinely thought that, um, that any conceivable UK government that might emerge after the, the, the coming election was likely to be bold on this issue, then I would be saying more power to your elbow and I would be, I would be genuinely trying to say, let's find ways for different political movements to work together on that agenda. Um, I'm finding it hard to end that without undermining my concept of the politics of hope. Um, I, 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 I don't see that likely from the parliamentary politics, from the, from the outcome of a UK election. I do think that hope exists if we can rekindle that power at grassroots level, at community level, at human level, uh, because in many ways that's the kind of participation that most people want to get involved in. The kind of folk who actually get involved in political parties uh, well, we're, we're not typical. We're a bit weird. You know, we, um, geek would, might be one of the, the, the friendlier words to use for people who, who, who spend their lives in, in party politics. Most people want to get involved in, in politics. Most people are political, but they're turned off party politics for quite understandable reasons. And I think we need to take power back into those spheres where people want to get involved, where people see a reason to get involved and put power back in their hands. Can I just take advantage of the chair to ask um, uh, just a very small question? I mean, you talked a lot about big business, but um, I, have, I haven't read the Citizens Advice Report uh, the, the, this morning, but um, I had the impression from what I overheard on the radio and so on that uh, actually it wasn't just big business, and, and in many ways the pressure is greatest in small businesses. Yeah, some of that pressure on small businesses, of course, comes from the competition uh, or the market conditions that are set by the, by the big boys. Mm. Um, and they are usually boys. Um, you know, when, when large employers uh, complain that, well, we have to pay these high salaries at the top and we have to pay minimum wage at the bottom because that's what market conditions dictate, they're telling a lie because they are the ones who set the market conditions. It's not the small independent businesses who set the market conditions. I think they're far more, they're, they're, their feeling of being under pressure of those market conditions is far more understandable. I do still think that there's more that we could do with, as I said, that package of, of business support services which exist, uh, which aren't always brilliant, but m a lot of small businesses do access them, do engage with them, and they could be a channel for talking about uh, different models of, of ownership, different ownership structure, uh, you know, whether you, you might be talking about a long-standing family business that's finding it hard to keep going, rather than seeing that business fail, how about talking about a model of shared ownership with the employees? How about talking about uh, a model of shared ownership with the local community that it serves? How about looking at these other uh, opportunities, not just to, to, to help the business through difficult times, but to help it adapt its model, adapt its ownership model to a more democratic workplace. Um, and there are, there are other things that we could do as well around some of the grants that government is giving out are going to the worst abusers. You know, Amazon, whether, whether you buy stuff off Amazon or not, very few people would justify its tax arrangements, its union busting track record, uh, or its treatment of employees at a day-to-day -day level. Very few people, I think, would, would seek to justify that. And yet, they got an RSA grant, Regional Selective Assistance Grant. Why don't we start applying conditions around tax justice, around uh, em employee participation, around economic justice, around you know, having a reasonable pay scale within the company? Attach some of those conditions to the grant schemes that are using all of our money 
taxpayers' money, money that's paid uh, by, not necessarily by the, the chief executives and the owners of, of, of these businesses, but certainly being paid uh, by the people who are at the bottom end of that pay scale. Well, that's one sort of policy step with regard to some of the questions that are being asked earlier. But there's a question here. Are there any other questions at the moment? There's several, in fact. Could I could perhaps do the ones in the back? I see three hands going across the, the back. So if they could keep hold, up, hold them up for just another minute. Yep, OK. We'll go down there, but we'll start at the front okay. here. Um, Maureen Nikra, Harriet Watt University. I'm slightly playing devil's advocate here. Um, to my mind, what happened in Greece wasn't an expression of the politics of hope, but more um, a sign of desperation, um, that there was nothing left to lose. You know this freedom is having nothing left to lose. And I'm interested in the relationship between hope and despair. Um, and maybe what has happened, the politics of hope here, is that we don't feel desperate enough. I mean, we're not doing great, but it's OK. Could be a lot worse. And that maybe to get people to begin to buy into the politics of hope, you may need to get them to feel more desperate, first of all, to get them to hope for something better. And can we just go, as it were, across the back? There were three hands all together, and we'll just take them. Uh, yeah, uh, David Gow. Uh, I'm tempted to ask, Patrick, uh, whatever happened to green politics? Because, uh, frankly, there's, um, I find what he's saying. I mean, if he were Greek, he no doubt would be a member of Syriza and would have been campaigning and hoping to get in the cabinet of uh, Alexis Tsipras. <coughs> but um, it seems to me that he's, he's campaigning on the same grounds as... Uh, frankly, uh, well, virtually the whole of the Scottish social democratic scene, whether you include who is, who's in it, I mean, who isn't in it, actually, basically. It always seems to embrace half of the Scottish Conservative and, uh, Party as well. But uh, so what is so whatever happened to the kind of the politics of green hope? Uh, because uh, I find your, uh, I mean, apart from uh, a few words about local energy companies uh, and so on, but even then, you could be a, an old-style member of the old Labour and uh, Cooperative Party. <laughs> and just in front of you? Release all my questions. Right, OK. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Haymans, um, Young Academy of Scotland. Um, it was really great to hear your talk, and I'm sure everyone in the room agreed or resonated with some of the things you said, and that's why I'm really glad the Green Party will be part of the UK debates. Um, but my problem with the Green Party is that you, you highlight so many issues and it's, you speak common sense, but what's lacking for me is the solutions. And some of the things you've said are that solutions should be coming from the grassroots level, so local authorities taking control. But that almost sounds a little bit like David Cameron's big society. And I'm just wondering where, how, how can the Green Party move to become one of the major parties? Because you speak such common sense but you need the solutions to back up. I mean, how do you answer these really difficult questions that you're posing? OK. Um, thanks very much. I think the, the question about the, the line between hope and desperation uh, is, is interesting. Um, I haven't spent time in Greece, I'm going to have to admit. So maybe the mood music, perhaps I'm reading it wrong. Um, I think a complete loss of hope, uh, I, I don't think that would lead to uh, the building of a movement. Uh, I think it might well lead to the clearing out of a, of a political class. But I think what's been done uh, with Syriza is, is not just the clearing out of a political class, it's actually the construction of something new from some elements that were there before, um, including the Greens, by the way, yes, um, some elements that were there before in different parts of, of the political landscape and different parts of society and academia, actually. Um, it, it does, to me, from afar, look like the building of something. And I don't think people build out of desperation. I think people who, are, who have truly lost hope uh, are, are less likely to have the, the willingness to commit time and energy to something that's they know is not going to deliver miraculous results overnight, but which is a new path, a new direction. And I, I think, to me, that's what it seems to represent. 
Uh, do people in this country feel desperate enough? Well, some people do. Uh, there will be others in the middle who don't, and there'll be others who uh, have done very well both out of the years of growth and out of the crisis uh, who will be sitting pretty. And it's very easy, it's a, a natural human instinct to think that most of the world is kind of like the bit of the world you mix in. Uh, yeah, that, that happens to us all. We can probably all recognise that in our own lives of, of kind of expecting the rest of the world and the rest of the people in it to be like us and like the people we, we mix with. Um, and I think it, if there's anything that's necessary in this country, it's a, a breaking down of the wall so that people see uh, a little bit of other people's lived daily experience and don't, don't get the, the, the sense that things are, are kind of okay because for a great, great many people, they're not. Um, but that's, again, that's about perception uh, as well, just as you're, you're, the, the way you framed the question was a, a kind of nuanced difference between two different emotions. This, this is about how we feel as well as how we perceive the world. Um, as, for, as for green politics, I, um, I uh, was uh, conceived in the same year as the Green Party. Uh, we, we entered the, the scene at the same time. Nice little coincidence. Uh, my mum was a, a party member in the, in the early days, uh, actually in its second incarnation. Its first was called People. It was, its first incarnation was called the People Party. Uh, its logo was an equal sign. And its rhetoric uh, was all deep green ecological uh, by today's standards and very, very focused on population crisis as the, uh, the sort of driving issue. And I find it interesting that pretty much around the world, uh, what we now see is uh, political parties who don't have an equal sign, but a, a flower or a planet or a leaf as their logo. They're not called people, they're called green or ecologist. But the rhetoric has, I would say, not shifted away from environmental politics, not shifted away from the core of ecological and green politics, but reached a point of connection between that and society and the economy, the place that most people live, the place that most people form their opinions. I mean, I'm not going to spend my life trying to get people to vote for better recycling policies. I want to engage with all of the issues that relate to the way people live. I want green politics which I, you know, I, I did talk about how we measure growth. What does growth mean to us? What are we growing and, and for whom? Uh, and I, I certainly talked about the idea of limits to growth. Limits to growth is a, a concept which became unfashionable, but I think never went away and was never wrong. Uh, and we're starting to come up against those limits now. Um, but we need, we absolutely need, if we want this argument to be taken seriously, we need to find ways to relate it to real people's daily lives. And when real people are living uh, in a society that doesn't meet their basic needs, when real people don't have enough money to put food on the table and need to go and ask, please may I have some, and feel humiliated in doing that, I, I don't think you can coherently talk about the, uh, the, the, the environmental concepts of, uh, that, that, that led to the formation of the green movement uh, without relating it to their daily lives. Food is actually one that I didn't touch on and I could have around the, the way in which the, a food chain, a food system has been in this country almost entirely handed over to a tiny number of multinationals, a tiny number of vast businesses which are imposing on the producers, the independent farmers, find it hard to make a living. The independent retailers find it hard to make a living. Land is being used inefficiently. Food is being used inefficiently. And people are being marketed with a message that says, consume not ever healthier food, but ever more processed food. Consume products. And, and breaking that link, that sense of connection of what food even is. Food is, is just products with a brand name rather than something that comes from the land that, that is in the community you, you live in. That connection of who we are with where our food comes from has been broken 
uh, by handing it over to this corporate power base. And yes, you can create a lot of shareholder value, but you can destroy something far more important. So yeah, I, I, would, I would say uh, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I or Ruth Davison would agree that, that the Scottish Conservatives are part of the social democratic consensus. You, you, might, you might have lost me on that one. But I would say absolutely, green politics has to bring a challenge to the notion uh, that we can live within this deregulated free market system which has brought us to the point of ecological crisis. We have to be the ones not only challenging that but saying that a, a different system is possible. And, and can, we, can we concretize that? Can we turn that into specifics? Well, in that, uh, j just in the, in the discussion we had uh, before we came into the room, uh, I mentioned those, those happy days of minority government in, in Scotland, that brief fleeting period where all parties uh, from left to right of the spectrum uh, were able to exert influence based on the quality of their ideas. And in that, in that moment, we not only, we, we put forward two major budget uh, asks uh, over that, that time period. One was about uh, a fund for empowering communities to come up with their own solutions on climate change. And it was born of a, a, a notion that for many people at the time, and this was before the, the climate change legislation was passed, for many people the issue was you know, somewhere on the list of things they ought to care about, but really hard to get hold of. And too often it felt like somebody was finger wagging saying, you have to give up your car, or you're not to live in this way, or you have to change. You know. And we wanted it to become something empowering. We wanted it to become something where people get the chance to say, I know how my community could be better, and by the way, greener as well, and join those dots. And so the Climate Challenge Fund uh, was one of our first budget concessions, and it has supported hundreds of community projects around Scotland w in ways that create specific local benefits that people can see walking through their community daily uh, in, in their daily lives, but it's also created, I, I believe, a sense that climate change is not just an abstract concept that scientists and politicians talk about, so that climate change is not about CO2 parts per million, but that climate change is about building uh, a, a more inclusive, happier, nicer, warmer, friendlier community. And if climate change can be in that, that space, if climate change can mean those things to people, then I think we've got the chance of, of some behaviour changes that they might never have contemplated if they'd just seen a poster saying, change your behaviour, you know? Uh, the second one was less bottom-up, a bit more top-down. It was recognising that investment in the energy efficiency of our homes is not going to happen by leaving it to the market. Uh, it's not going to happen by leaving it to individuals to recognise I can save lots of money if I spend a little bit of money because a lot of people either don't have the time or don't know how to go about it or uh, may not be living in their property for very long and don't have an incentive to do it. And so uh, a national uh, investment scheme to improve the, the, the quality of our housing stock is, is, is one of the things that we argued for. We haven't, we've never quite managed to get the, the Scottish Government to do everything that we asked for on that, but they've come a great deal of the way. They're spending a great deal more on that priority now than they were beforehand. And I think most of the budgets that have gone by since then, uh, that have gone through the Scottish Parliament, have seen significant increases. We're still behind the curve. We're still not doing what the Scandinavians do, do and we're still building, uh, in many places, inefficient homes. And that comes back to some of the stuff I came, came up with earlier about how do we fund the extra build cost to make sure that we're building really, really uh, energy-positive homes and make sure that people are getting the benefit from that of not having this big bill to pay every quarter or not having to be reliant on uh, these kind of humiliating... Uh, schemes that, that in, in many ways end up with the poorest people paying the most for their energy. Um, you know, some progress has been moved, made about moving away from that, but if we could, if we could join the dots there, uh, then I think we'd, we'd have some really clear, concrete examples of, of green politics in action. Uh, and I think we've, I think we've done, we've come, come some of the way, uh, but yeah, we, we always need to do better. And um, I think a small political party that is far from power, one of the failings that's natural, that again comes from, from human instinct, is that we spend a lot of our time writing policies 
uh, and you end up with hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of policies uh, rather than thinking, here's one thing we can achieve this year and communicating it really well. So um, that's something that we'll, we'll keep trying to get better on. You've now come back for... <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Picking up on that, could you just introduce yourself Sorry, again? My name's Ewan Leach. I'm from yep. the Built Environment Forum Scotland. Um, new homes, heating systems, sexy stuff. But they're <laughs> the tip of the iceberg when it comes to um, housing stock because actually most of it already exists. And so that is the big issue as to how we, in an environmental sense, deal with that. And I, I suppose we've had... Um, Fuel Poverty Week recently, mm -hmm. I think it's National Cold Week this week. Um, over 50% of existing building stock housing has critical elements of disrepair, which means they're not wind and water tight. Really fundamental. A lot of people think, let's get insulation in, but actually that's pointless if it's not wind and water tight. What is your take on how we address what is a major housing issue and one that's going to become increasingly critical as we spend money on kitchens and holidays, but not on repair? Just or retrofit. Just one, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just take that one on, on its yes, own. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I live in, um, like most people in Glasgow do, in a tenement, and some tenements have uh, been brought up to standard, but a great many tenements still have rattling windows uh, and have uh, roofs that you only need to see where the where the snow melts in winter time, and you can see the heat that's coming out of them. Um, tenements, I think, are offer a really interesting possibility for taking a collective approach uh, to improving our existing building. In, I mean, in so many parts of our, our cities, these are kind of standard, you know, uh, across huge, huge areas, large numbers of people living in them. And yet, if you live in a tenement, the way you're encouraged to think of it is that you live in your little box and you look out onto your street. And you're encouraged not to think of the tenement as a building that you share with all of those other people in those other parts of that building. Um, and partly fragmented tenure has, has worsened that, the, the sense that you just own or rent your little box. Partly the, the way in which we use our back courts as nasty, smelly bin sheds that no one wants to go into, uh, encouraging people not to think about that that space between them, that space that could bring the community together. If we took a collective approach, again, to investing in tenements, and, you know, there, there is, because of fragmented tenure, it's, it's difficult to, to bring that about. But if we can find a way to do that, uh, then we could be investing in improving the fabric of those buildings, whether that's windows, whether it's roofs, whether it's walls, whether it, in some it might need to be internal insulation, but that's not you know, different solutions for different places. In some, it might be uh, a small CHP unit. In some, it might be a district heating scheme. In some, it might be something that connects with the wider community. If we could do that, then we not only have a, 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 a better, more efficient existing stock of housing, but we have the kind of housing that brings people together and gets them to re relate to one another as a community and use that piece of land in the middle to meet one another. And, and, and be a community. And that's the way tenements used to be when there was some collective service involved. I mean, it, nobody would, probably very few people would want to go back to having collective uh, laundry. Uh, people like to have that in their own flat. But having some kind of collective element of the servicing of a building, and energy is an obvious candidate, uh, actually could get people to relate to one another and, and, and look at a, a physical fabric improvement as well as a, a community relationship improvement. Uh, I think um, some folk on the, the island of Egg uh, who have done so much to transform their own environment uh, talk about viewing tenements as uh, uh, your, your own little island, you know, thinking of that as an island in its own right. How much of our needs do we need to import into this island and how much of it can we meet within our own resources? Uh, yeah, it's probably not quite a perfect metaphor, but thinking about it in those terms could be beneficial. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, investing in the, in the, in the existing built environment, both in terms of how we use it and its physical fabric, unavoidable, absolutely. Another question at the back, are there any more? Yeah, one down, two down here at the, the front as well. So we'll take these three. 
Uh, my name is Derek Scott. Uh, Patrick, last year you, one of the things that stuck with me was you said that in an independent Scotland, and we're looking at a finance bill, you wouldn't entrust the job to KPMG. Now, <laughs> earlier this week, I was in one of KPMG's Scottish offices, and there was a leaflet on their reception desk promoting something called the Living Wage Foundation. Kind of cut, half impressed with, although Boris Johnson was on the leaflet as well, so it wasn't quite what I wanted. But <laughs> given the sponsors of this series of talks, Patrick, what, what message would you have for the professions? Some represented here, some not here, but what would you like the professions to be doing? Because the professions actually get inside the boardrooms. They do actually associate with these high overpaid people you've talked about, and, and maybe the professions need to do a bit more, not just the politicians. And the two others were down here. And I see a hand from KPMG, but uh, <laughs> I'll maybe ask her to hold it for just a few minutes. Yeah. My name is Ian Doig. I'm a semi-retired accountant and now non-exec director on a number of not-for-profit bodies, public services and charities. So um, I found an awful lot to agree with in what you're saying. Your analysis is pretty well spot on. I think two of the big problems we've got in this country, one is the big two-party system, and what we need is not marginal changes to the economy. We need a whole different economy, point one. And the other one is multinational companies who are absolutely ruthless in maximizing profit and footloose, they'll go wherever suits them. So I agree with a lot of what you're saying and I'm tempted to vote for your party. I wanted just to explore how your party can get more influence because the problem I've got with that is there's a danger it's a, a wasted vote because you're not going to form the next government, you're not going to produce uh, a prime minister or a first minister um, and coalitions have advantages and disadvantages so what I'd be looking for from you is you to be a moderator and exercise influence and traction on the other parties and as part of that you need to be fairly independent and say the sort of things you're saying so how, how are you going to add value by adding that moderating influence if, if people vote for you and just beside you for... Um, my name is John Lincoln. Uh, just a question for myself, really. Um, I just recently heard that 1% of the uh, world's population owns 99% of the world. And I would guess that if you own a house in Edinburgh, you probably come into that 1%. Uh, I don't know how tenements in Glasgow figure in that, but... Uh, and also that if you're actually unemployed in this country, you're in the top 10% of the world's in terms of the world's wealth and income. Now, uh, David Cameron uh, gets a lot of stick from his own party from, for uh, contributing 0.7% of GDP to uh, overseas aid. Uh, what percentage do you think it should be and how would, how would uh, you see, seek to increase that? Uh, in that you've talked a lot about domestic issues but not a lot about international ones. Are we, are we hearing from KPMG as well? No, I'll hold on. Because oh, right, okay. there's, if, if you could be sufficiently brief with yep. your reply to these three, there was a gentleman over here who wanted a question, and I could give KPMG okay. an opportunity at that point as okay. well, and then we'll finish the... Well, uh, I probably did say uh, last year as we were running up to the, the independence vote uh, that I, I wouldn't have wanted KPMG to write the tax code for an independent Scotland. Uh, I, I'm fairly sure I didn't say they were the devil. Um, but in my view, there is a, a problem structurally with having a great deal of government uh, outsourced. Now, that, that's something in relation to service delivery, unaccountable service delivery. It's also a problem in relation to policy and expertise uh, because all of these things in government are supposed to be democratically accountable. Uh, I, would, I would make the case that um, you know, not just in relation to the way that uh, some uh, of these big agencies support or advise uh, other, other clients in, 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 in ways that I would not personally admire, so, you know, if, if I was advising any company, I would, I would be wanted, wanting to talk to them about their pay ratios, and I'm not sure that the current... Uh, well, no, I'm completely sure that the, the, the current 
landscape uh, of how businesses uh, seek skills, how they seek advice, uh, it, it's quite clear that it hasn't led to uh, a, a retreat from that, that pay inequality. Um, there's, there's, there's good stuff around things like the living wage that any big employer or big business can do. Uh, and sometimes it really matters. And sometimes pretty much everybody working for that business was getting paid over the living wage anyway. So it's kind of an easy badge to wear. Um, I, I would like us to be, you know, let, let's imagine there had been a yes vote. I would like us to be making sure uh, that the skilling up of the Scottish civil service that would have been so vital on a whole host of issues uh, was done in a way that was democratically accountable. And I fear that if it had been done by buying in consultancies from the private sector, it would have done the opposite. And we would have ended up making some of the very same mistakes that the UK government has made after having bought in advice and expertise from the same sources. Um, so I hope that's a, a, a balanced answer <laughs> without, being, without being too provocative. Um, PR is, proportional representation is clearly a, a, a better way of, of deciding who is going to uh, exercise power in a society than first past the post. First past the post has advocates, and even they have as their strongest argument that first past the post delivers strong, decisive government. Well, that's not true anymore, is it? Uh, first past the post doesn't achieve a fair reflection of the views of society, and it also doesn't achieve strong, decisive government. Personally, I think strong, decisive government that doesn't have a majority support should not be strong and decisive. Uh, I, I would like to see, if there's a balance of views uh, across the country, I would like that balance to be reflected in Parliament and in government as well. And for, for that to, to relate to some of the arguments around how politicians behave. My, my experience of Greens in other European countries, and I, I'm, I meet with them as often as I can, uh, you know, most other European countries do have uh, a more prominent Green Party, well, not most, Many of the major European countries have a more prominent Green Party in their parliamentary politics than the UK has, certainly, because they have this experience of PR. And they also have an expectation that politicians finding ways to work together is normal uh, and that reaching uh, a compromise without compromising on basic principles is possible and that it's not something that should be reported in scandalous terms about U-turns but that it's, it's actually about finding a way through uh, a difficult balance of, of opinions uh, on an issue. I, I would like to make the case that Greens have done that in the Scottish Parliament when we can. We are people who find common ground with the Labour Party, with the SNP, with the Liberals, and yes, once in a while, even with those famous Social Democrats, the Scottish Conservatives. We, we have examples of having found common ground uh, across the political spectrum, and we're able to do that and still criticize and challenge when we think that is vital. Uh, you can do both, and believe it or not, you can still be friends. I think actually the, the thing that's, that's problematic about the political dynamic in Scotland is the Labour SNP tribalism. Um, any, ma many of you, I'm sure, have uh, engaged with, with MPs at Westminster on a number of issues. You will know that there are cross-party friendships in Westminster. You go into the bar at Holyrood any day of the week, evening of the week, let's say, you will not see Labour and SNP folk having a drink together. It just doesn't happen. And I think that's a problem. There is no sense uh, of being part of a, an institution where people can work together. Uh, it happens a little bit on specific policy issues. I was, I was in a room with, with Bristol there today on a cross-party group on science and technology. And yes, there are individuals in that cross-party group who'll, who'll work together to run that cross-party group. It hasn't extended to the point of friendship. Uh, and, and a great deal of the, the political debates that we have are so tribally hostile, even when they want to do the same thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the bedroom tax was such a good example. We had months and months and months of Labour and SNP both trying to outdo each other on hating the bedroom tax more, but both trying to blame each other 
for the fact that they couldn't get agreement on how to deal with it. Finally, it happened. Finally, it happened. Uh, but it could have been done six months earlier if, if, the, if the will had been there to work together rather than to blame each other. Um, the, the issues of, of how uh, an unequal society relates to the world around it, uh, I think that the statistic, uh, if I remember it rightly, it was that the, the, the richest 1% own more wealth than the rest of the 99% uh, of the world. Uh, so it's, it's, it's something which is stark, it's something which is uh, something this country is complicit in, but not just this country, we're operating within a wider world. And again, I think it comes that, back to what I was saying earlier about how people perceive one another's lives. Uh, if, if, if the wealthiest, which, you know, the, the wealthiest two or three percent probably includes a great many people who live in Edinburgh, for example. Uh, the wealthiest 10 percent probably includes a great many people who live in this country. Uh, and yet, the, the, the sense is from some, on, particularly on the, on the far right uh, of politics, that uh, contributing part of our wealth uh, to those who uh, have the least in the world, those from whom we took the most in many cases, uh, and in some cases from whom we still take the most. Uh, the idea that that, that kind of uh, aid commitment is, is, is unreasonable, I, I think, again, speaks of that disconnect, that sense that people are living in different bubbles and, and don't understand uh, one another's lives. And I think that ma many, many of the, 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 the international uh, attempts that schools in Scotland have made to, to put international development onto the curriculum, I think, are really inspiring in the way that they're getting kids to see beyond the clothes that they're wearing and think about the people who made the clothes that they're wearing um, and the conditions they live with. Uh, I, I don't recall uh, uh, what a recent manifesto had to say on it. I think our party policy is for 1% rather than 0.7%, uh, but I will check that and um, I'll, I'll, I'll be more on the ball with that by the time we launch the manifesto, I promise. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask... Jenny Stewart from KPMG and the gentleman down here to ask the final or make the final comments um, and please keep it very, very brief because we've reached the point when we really should be going for wine, I think. <clears throat> uh, Jenny. Jenny Stewart from KPMG. Um, thanks for your talk, Patrick. Really interesting. I should add a bit of context. Uh, I have actually read Limits to Growth because as I, when I was a student in... Uh, Belgium, I did my dissertation on the transfer of the ecology movement into a political party mm. because not many people know this, Belgium was the first uh, country to have an elected uh, Green MP. So context, um, in terms of the comments on the tax code, um, I feel I should um, point out for this audience that KPMG has very strong, clearly defined tax principles and conducts all its business on the basis of those strong ethical principles which have been enshrined with us for many years. Uh, so I will certainly make that point. Um, in terms of um, advising government and the work that we do is obviously all done with our clients and we, have, uh, we embed all of our work for government on that basis. Um, we are generating a whole debate on um, ethics and business, which is really, really important to us. Um, and we've been having roundtable forums with a number of um, groups across society to really start engendering a, a more serious debate about that, uh, and particularly around tax. Uh, and we'll be holding a session in uh, Edinburgh in due course. Um, and if you'd like to take part, I would be very well, <laughs> you'd be very, very welcome, because we have, um, it is a, a very wide cross-party group that we've had. Um, coming on, on to the living wage, and I did want to raise the living wage because I think, you, you know, you have talked about the strategic and policies and so on, but the challenge was, you know, what are the practical points that need to be uh, taken forward? And I think the living wage is something that, obviously, we are a proud living wage employer. We've been paying it to our own staff since 2006, and as you say, it's very easy for a company like ours to pay for our own staff, but in order to get living wage foundation accreditation, you have to play it right through your supply chain. So we've been playing it right through our supply chain since 2007. And we've been trying very hard to encourage other employers to do that, and we're seeing huge movement. Um, that's why it's quite difficult to then characterize the debate into big business or small business or whatever. I think it's really important that there is more of a coalition around particular issues, and so rather than being 
divisive on the issue, I think the living wage is something that people can get together and really start promoting rather than finger pointing, um, which I was glad to say you were uh, against. Um, and the research that we produce every year looks at what percentage of the population is paid below the living wage. Um, in Scotland, it's 18% versus 22% across, but it's concentrated in a number of sectors. So really, if we're to make a big difference around the proportion of the workforce, then it is in catering, it's in retail. Um, those are the two big ones. And so those are the areas that, from a practical point of view, um, then I think there's a lot we could do to move that forward. Sorry, that was quite a long <laughs> point. It's all right, Jenny. But, but I think it is a practical, <laughs> it is something practical that we can, all, uh, we can all hang on to. My question would be, what would you do around tax? <laughs> okay. Patrick, I may ask you just to say a very few words, and then okay. I'm going to yep. make a signal and get Ray onto the platform, and he Super. will finish the show off. Well, uh, can I just say uh, thank you for the, the invitation to take part in a, a further discussion uh, about some of those issues, and I would, I would welcome that chance. Uh, you know, I, I do uh, welcome any employer, uh, whether it's, you know, large or small, uh, wherever they're based, whatever sector, to, to pay the living wage and to, and to work that through the supply chain. I want to see that living wage increase. I think it needs to be at £10 an hour and soon. Uh, and it does leave me nauseated when I hear the likes of Boots, uh, chief exec, uh, come out and complain uh, about um, Labour's approach to, to big business in particular. These, these are guys that don't pay the living wage, that do keep people on zero hours contracts and do uh, avoid their taxes uh, both as individuals and at a corporate level. So uh, I very much hope that they are the kind of company that would fail uh, your tax ethics test and, and that you would not be willing to take them on as a client. I've no idea whether you do or not. <laughs> uh, I've no idea whether you do or not, uh, but I, I would hope that's the kind of test that you're applying. As for, as for uh, the next stage, beyond the living wage, I think the next debate beyond a, a decent living wage needs to be about maximum wage ratios, needs to be about the principal difference between what the highest and the lowest in a company are paid. You know, not so long ago, just a, two or three decades ago, you were talking about a ratio of maybe 20 or 30 between the, the CEOs of the biggest businesses in the States and the average workers uh, in, their, in, their, in their businesses. Now you're looking at a ratio of 200, 300, 400 times what the average worker earns at that CEO level in the biggest businesses. Now it may not be quite as bad as that uh, in uh, you know, businesses in this country, but it's bad. It, it's worse in some sectors like the city of London, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that we need to, to get to grips with. And I, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be talking about uh, a 10 to 1 or a 20 to 1 ratio between the highest and the lowest paid people uh, in a business uh, and, and be willing to talk about the concept of enough and figure out what enough means. Uh, as, as for tax, uh, I, again, let's, let's maybe park that and discuss that as a future opportunity because it's a whole other subject that could go on for another, uh, another uh, set of hours. Uh, let, let's just uh, give one example that uh, 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 an ethical tax criteria, either for uh, a business to deal with another business or a government to provide business support services might be, we don't deal with you if you use tax havens at all, full stop, either your business or your senior management uh, and, uh, and non-exec directors. That would be a, a, a good principle, and it would see at least one person I know kicked off the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisors. That'd be a start. <laughs> Um, if you see the next Green Manifesto sponsored by KPMG, remember you, <laughs> you heard it here first. Uh, can I, on your behalf, thank Patrick Harvey for his excellent uh, speech and for responding uh, to the very good questions so well this evening. Uh, can I thank Hector McQueen for chairing the discussion so well. Can I thank, on our behalf, you all for coming and invite you to take a drink with us outside. Thank you very much indeed.